Lopez wants it away. And it's a deep to left center. Andrew Jones on the run. This one has a chance. Home run. Mike Piazza. And the Mets lead. Three to two. Bartolo has done it. The impossible has happened. This is one of the great moments in the history of baseball. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, Mets fans of all ages, here is your host, Nick. Hello, Mets fans. Welcome back to another episode of Believe in the Mets. I'm your host, Nick Durst, and it's very hard right now to believe in the Mets. Very depressing week for a lot of us Mets fans who are left just scratching our heads here after we see the Mets not be able to get the manager they thought they were going to get in Craig Council, which they thought was going to be a foregone conclusion. Classic example of don't count your eggs before they hatch. And this is what happens here. The Mets now, they have to go to a plan B. And I'm not very happy with who they end up going with. They go end up going with a bench coach from the Yankees. Typically, when you see a bench coach get the job as a manager it's because they've come from a team that has won a championship or two and to me I just do not understand this move at all here there was some rumors that maybe Buckshaw Walter lost the locker room last year and you need to get a stronger voice in the locker room so let's get a first-time manager coming from the dysfunctional New York Yankees coming off their worst season in 30 years Joining me now to discuss this and break it all down much further. You may have seen his columns in New York for a long, long time. A lot of stuff in football. You may have seen some of his books. But he, like us, he shares in the pain. He is a long-suffering Mets fan like all of us. Welcome to the show, Gary Myers. Gary, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Your initial thoughts when you hear the news that the Mets... They finally hired their manager, but it was not Craig Council because David Stearns couldn't get him. It was Carlos Mendoza coming over from the Yankees. I I was just, I was really surprised because I thought Stearns and Council were a a package deal. I I know that um, Steve Cohen's been going after Stearns for a couple of years before we even knew that Council would be available. So I think he still would have hired Stearns, but it seemed to be a given that based on his, um, Stern's relationship with Council in Milwaukee for I think it was seven years that uh, that he would follow him and 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 Steve Cohen would set a new record for what a manager was going to be paid. Uh, it just seemed to be a long shot that he would stay in Milwaukee even though his family was there. That the money difference would be so great that he would they would have to take the job and uh, to lose out on getting Council and him not remaining in Milwaukee but going to another team in Chicago. Um, but that's really surprising. Now I'm not going to put Craig council on this pedestal and say, Oh, the Mets are ruined now because they didn't get him. I mean, he didn't have, he got to the playoffs a bunch of times, but didn't have a lot of success. So it's not like you're going after a football coach and you miss out on bill Parcells and have to settle for the defensive back coach for a non-playoff team. Um, I don't put counsel at that level. I think that he's considered one, you know, one of the handful of best managers in baseball, but uh, we just don't know. I think the problem is we don't know much about Carlos Mendoza. So going, is it really, is that the best they can do with a bench coach from a team that didn't make the playoffs last year? This, this guy, I mean, I know he had some interviews over the last few years, including this year. Maybe he turns out to be the best choice. Sometimes the second choice is the best choice. We just don't have the answers to that now. Yeah. I'm not, mad that they didn't get counsel. I'm mad at the way this whole thing shook out because you could not tell me under any circumstance that the Mets will be better in 2024 with Carlos Mendoza as manager over Buck Showalter. This hiring here is a below the Mendoza line hiring here, getting Carlos Mendoza here. Maybe it turns out to be good. I don't know, but I get worried because the last time I heard, oh, he's so, he's so well prepared. That the guys love him. He's a good communicator. That was Lee Rojas, and that turned out great. And the last time I heard that before him was Mickey Calloway, and that right. didn't turn out. So 
I thought this is a franchise that needed someone with some sort of experience here to kind of, you know, if there was an issue with the locker room, command that locker room here. So I'm puzzled by this, as 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 we, we a lot of us are. I haven't seen too many of your colleagues in the media really supporting this too much. Of course, the Yankee beat writers are saying great things about the guy, and I'm sure he's a great guy. But the pressure is on Carlos Mendoza from day one. And if the Mets lose opening day, which they never do, there's going to be a lot of questions. They lose the first series. They, you know, they don't start off too hot. Is this guy going to be able to handle the heat, handle the pressure, handle the question from the media? And if you, of course, a media member, you're in New York. A lot of these coaches or managers, whatever the sport is, they just can't handle it. And I thought this is a this is a tough spot for a first time manager to come into a team with a tremendous payroll. So how do you think Mendoza here? You know, obviously don't know about him, but how do you think he's going to be treated early on by the media? And how do you think the hot seat is going to be heating up on him throughout the season if there is any sort of issues and how the media responds to that? Well, Nick, I think the first thing we have to find out is what kind of team are the Mets going to have right. when free agency is over. Uh, if they somehow get Otani and, and then the, the Japanese pitcher they're pursuing and and they build the roster right back up to where they thought they had it last year, then of course there's a lot of pressure on Mendoza to win. But it, if they just go you know, bargain shopping in free agency and maybe add a piece or two to the team that ended last season, which had an awful lot of holes – then the expectations won't be as high, so the pressure won't be as, as great. You know, what you mentioned about Showalter, I tweeted the other day, like, at this point, why didn't they just bring back Buck? And that was more of a rhetorical question. I think it's pretty clear why they didn't bring him back, is that David Stearns wanted to start with a clean slate. A lot of times, you know, football, I covered football my whole career. Wow. When a new general manager came in, you know, nine times out of ten, the coach would be fired if the owner hadn't already fired him and they gave the general manager a chance to, you know, have a coach that he was on the same page with that they were on parallel contracts. Uh, so they both had the same thing at, at stake. It's very hard to bring in a general manager as the boss and then have a manager or a coach under him uh, who's more well-known is more well established like Buck was, you know, versus Stearns. And, you know, I don't know, how, since I don't cover the Mets, I just know an awful lot about them. I don't know, how overbearing Billy Epler was with Buck in terms right. of trying to concoct the lineup on a day. Seemed like basis. it with the report that you know, Mike Vogelback. Puma put out about Vogelback having yeah. to be wedged in there. Yeah, and, and Stearns is probably saying, I don't want to get into a situation where I have a veteran manager and with general managers having so much more control over the lineup on a day-to-day -day basis now, he didn't want any pushback from his manager. Now, I'm not saying Mendoza is going to be a pushover or a puppet or anything like that because I don't know enough about him. And he doesn't have a track record here, but clearly Stearns wanted somebody that was his handpicked choice that he's already worked out how it's going to work on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of, okay, this is the input I'm going to have. This is how we're going to treat analytics. Here's how our Ivy League guys are going to com compile information for you. Here's what I want you to use. All that has already worked out. And chances are that Mendoza was more agreeable to that than than Buck ever would have been. My regret about Buck is that he never had a chance to, to Stearns. Right. And to find out, you know, what the guy expectation, what his expectations were in terms of a, a president of op baseball operations manager relationship is. I think he owed it to himself. He owes it to Steve Cohen. And I think he owed it to the players who seem to really like Buck. I don't buy anything about, you know, a fractured locker room. You would the Francisco Lindor, who was one of the most respected players in the team, loved Buck. Right. And and the team Pete Alonso. Pete Alonso, loved Buck. the two team leaders, love Buck. That's that was good. Nerds enough. are love Buck. Verlander love Buck. All the veterans, all the young guys. I, I never heard anybody speak barely about Buck. So it was, just, it was just confusing that those things were put out. But who knows, you know, who's chirping in the front office to what reporter to kind of yeah. Spin Everybody's the got their own agenda there. Right. And I mean, the only thing you can say about Buck that I probably would agree with is I don't think he did a great job with the bullpen. But then again, not having Diaz last year changed everything. 
Um, so I give him a pass on that. And the other is he didn't incorporate, and this has been through tr- throughout the course of his career, he's slow incorporating the young guys. And I guarantee you, if Brett Beatty hit, he would have played. When they brought him up early in the season, he would have been the everyday third baseman for the rest of the year, but he didn't hit. So what choice do you have? Right. Um, so I, I certainly hope Buck gets a chance to manage again. To, again, this is to me, at least for this year, I think we'll say it's a downgrade in the manager spot, but it's a little surprising. I guess that, you know, Stearns is not realizing that the last three World Series winning managers, they're all in their late 60s to early yeah. 70s, and Brian Snicker, Dusty Baker, and Bruce Bochy. So I think you could there there were people available. You know, a Joe Madden, he won a World Series. Obviously, he would have been great for the media, but maybe he would have been pretty uh pretty <laughs> wild. Uh you also had I don't think Dusty Baker wants to retire. I think the Astros are walking to move on. So there were some people I think you could have got, but make no mistake about it. David Stearns did not get his guy that he wanted. So it's it's a plan B here. In baseball, it's three strikes and you're out. He's down 0-1 in the counts here because he did not get counsel. And now the other two pitchers come in at the Otani fastball and the Yamamoto fastball. So if he goes 0-3 there and strikes out, the Mets fans are vicious. They're not gonna. They're already gonna turn on Stearns before the season starts. And I don't know how realistic it is that the Mets are gonna get either of these guys, mm-hmm. uh, because right now we have to. You have to worry about what has become the Steve Cohen effect, which we just saw with Council. We saw last year with Steven Matz, and that is people are going to come to the Mets to drive the bidding money up, and they don't want to come to New York. They don't want to be here. They don't want to deal with the pressures, and they'll. Go to the Midwest or they'll go to the West Coast where there's less media members. So I don't know what's going to happen here, Gary, if the Mets can't get Otani and they can't get Yamamoto, because then it's going to be proving, obviously, Max Scherzer is correct. I didn't think he had any reason to lie that when he was told it's not about 2024, it's more about 2025. So if the Mets come up here empty handed in this offseason, especially when they don't have much of a rotation outside of Quintana and Sanger right now. You can't go into a season with Lucchese, Peterson, and McGill in the rotation. Maybe you could live with one. It's not going to be pretty for Stearns with, from the Mets fans right now. Well, as far as Otani is concerned, we know he's not going to be pitching in 24. Right. Um, and I, I don't, you know, from what I understand, it doesn't seem like the Mets are high on his list. Um it, if he's going to stay on the West Coast, if he stays with the Angels, or probably more likely the Dodgers, the, um, Seattle, or, or the Giants. If he comes to New York, would he rather go pitch for the Yankees and the Mets, play for the Yankees or Mets? I'd be happy just to have him next year as a hitter. And then if he pitches again after that, then it, it, it's a bonus. Um, I, 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 I do think they're going to try to compete. I don't think they're going to try to compete at the same level in terms of their free agent signings that they did when they signed Scherzer and then Verlander, when, you know, clearly indicated they were all in, they, they did get a lot of young prospects back who moved to the top of their, the list of best prospects, but you know, who knows when these guys are going to be ready. So I do think that this is gearing up more for a run in 25 than the next year. I think they'll, they'll be competitive in 24, but and, and maybe cosmetically they'll try to do some things that will convince Mets fans that they're, they're trying to still win a championship in 24. But everything seems to be trending in the direction, Nick, that uh, 24 is a transition year to see what they got with some of these young players and all the trades that they made, find out how quickly they can get them up to the major leagues. Um, yeah. And I then, think and there's got to be some trade that has to go down the soft season because – they acquired four shortstops at the deadline last year and all these position players. Last time I checked, the Mets have no pitching depth in the minors and they need to turn one of these people, whether it is Acuna who they acquired, whether it is Jet Williams who they drafted, all these shortstops. They need to turn these over for a starting pitcher, a, a Shane Bieber from the Gardens who's going to move, Tyler Glass now from the Rays, Corbin Burns from the Brewers. So I want to see if, if Stearns is making one of these trades. He's been heralded for making great trades pitching wise before. And right now I'm, I'm with you. I'm leaning towards, they're not really going to 
try too hard this year. That's maybe they'll do some stuff, some cosmetics on it, but their offense dating back to the Atlanta Braves series in 2022 through the wild card series against the Padres and all of last season was putrid. Uh, yeah. Alonzo, he had his power numbers. Lindor, he ended up with good numbers, but he had a really poor stretch to start the year. McNeil, he led the team in batting average, but it was still 60 points down from the previous season. Nimmo was healthy, but Marte wasn't there. Vogelback was DHing. You got nothing out of Vientos, really. Nothing out of Beatty. Maybe that's more on the manager for not playing them as much. So they need to do, do something here. They cannot go into the next season with the plan of we're going to have DH be Mark Vientos and DJ Stewart. That's not going to work out, Gary, if they have those two as the team. No, I thought, you know, you, you made a really good point about the way the 22 season ended, where they got swept in Atlanta. And then that, that first game against San Diego in the wild card round, Max Scherzer on the top of the first inning took all the energy out of the building by playing uh, home run derby with, with the Padre hitters. Um, the biggest problem to me with the Mets going into last season is they were just running it back. Yep. The, the everyday lineup was basically the same. They added Verlander. They lost to Grom. And, um, and okay, let's go. And Yeah, we kept being told, oh, Aguayo Escobar had such a great September. What about his April through August, which exactly, is horrible? Exactly. And the, the fact that they, they failed so miserably down the stretch in 22, you, you got to shake things up. There's got to be a, a key player in an everyday position that's different. And there wasn't until – um, Alvarez came up because I'm not even counting Beatty because he didn't start the season with him and then right. he didn't hit. But Alvarez was the first impact player that they added to the lineup uh, that was different from 2022. So I, I think they Epler and maybe an extent by an extension, Showalter and maybe Steve Cohen just figured they won 101 games. They got cold at the wrong time. We don't want to pay DeGrom, but we'll pay Verlander on a shorter, shorter contract. And um, and we'll get right back to the same spot we were the previous season. And obviously, you know, that didn't happen because nobody hit for the until July. Right. And um, they needed some fresh blood in there last year from the very start of the season. Right. And I think Mauricio was called up about four months too late. <laughs> Who's that? I'm sorry? Ronnie Mauricio. Mauricio, yeah. But I, I, I trust him on the fact that they, they probably didn't feel he was ready, you know, sure. especially defensively. Um, but yeah, it's going to be interesting to see what they do with him going to next yeah. season. Is he going to play second every day? Is he play third? Does Beatty move to the outfield? I think if you're running it back, if you're running into next season, not saying we're going to go for the World Series, I want to see Mauricio play every day, get him 150 at bats out of the gate, and let's see what he can do. He shows right, some great flashes. And again, are going to go now into year three, well, two, but with, with Beatty at third base, okay. But you got to have some sort of plan that if he's batting 212 in late June, you have to pivot somehow. So I want to see how that place shakes out. I hope they acquire uh, a big time hitter for this lineup because the offense has been an issue. But I think right now, I think, I think they'll make a, a bid for Otani. Doesn't seem like he's going to be interested. The Mets are going to offer a lot of money. We know that. But if it's like, you know, apples and oranges, it's not going to be like apples and oranges here between what the Dodgers and the Mets are offering. It's going to be, they're going to be in the same ballpark relatively right. speaking. And the same is going to go for Yamamoto with his money coming from the Mets, the Yankees, the Red Sox, the Giants, the Texas Rangers, I think, are going to be in play on both of these players because they have all this unlimited bankroll. So it looks like the Mets may be, will shift their gears and plans to a pursuit of Juan Soto in 2025, which would line up closely with the timeline for the Mets. But something that I want to propose here perhaps is a big trade this offseason with the Padres who are broke. Uh, I'd never heard of this in all my years that they had to take a $50 million loan out in the middle of a season to pay their salaries. So, Obviously, they're moving Soto here. The Mets, they're not going to really have the top-end prospects to get a Soto. But what they can offer is Steve Cohen's money. And I know we've been hearing rumblings that the Mets, uh, not the Mets, that the Padres 
would love to get out of their Fernando Tatis contract deal. So maybe if Cohen wants to use his money, Gary, uh, and and Stearns is all for it, you could say, you know, we want Soto. We can't give you the the, the greatest prospects. We'll give you who we got. Uh, but what we'll do is, for if we're giving you lesser people, we'll take Soto back, and we'll take Soto with Tatis, and we'll mm-hmm. take all Tatis's deal. I think that it's kind of out there that thing, but that kind of a trade, but it could be plausible because I think the only team that financially would take on that Fernando Tatis contract at this point. I know he, had, he just had a great year. He won a gold glove in the outfield, but obviously he got suspended the year before and he has been having those injuries with his motorcycle accidents. The only team that could really afford to take on that contract would be the Mets. So do you think that is something that the Padres pursue, maybe not with the Mets, but just trying to package Soto with Tatis to move some money? Well, I mean, Nick, I think that's a great point. I mean, I hadn't thought about that, but um, – I think you've seen now in baseball and and other sports that, you know, teams are are willing to take on other teams' salaries uh, in order to, you know, just do a a salary dump for the, you know, like like the Mets wanted to get rid of Scherzer and Verlander. They wanted the prospects back, so they're paying most of the the salary. Um, it's just in football, the Giants traded Leonard Williams to Seattle, but they're paying most of his salary, but they got a second round draft pick back for it. So they basically, you know, paid millions of dollars for a second round pick. So if you have one team that's in somewhat of financial distress and, and they have some assets there that they don't want to pay anymore, uh, and there's a limited number of teams that we willing to take on the contract, then certainly you throw that in as an enticement. Okay, you want Juan Soto for – We'll take these three prospects, but you've got to give us some, some financial relief and take Tatis with him. And, you know, to add Soto and Tatis to the Mets lineup, you know, would be pretty good. It's not your money and it's not my money. Right. I'm just dreaming or, here. But or, I, I to some I degree, it is because we pay for the tickets. But right. um, I, I think Mets fans would probably be in favor of something like that. And, but that's an interesting concept. They're creative. Use your resources to, to kind of approve this team. Because if I have the choice of let's pay for a top prospect or let's pray for trade for a proven commodity, let's take the proven commodity that's an all-star. Get some juice in here. You mix in the younger guys as you go along. And you have to have some faith that David Stearns is going to build up this farm system uh, based on his past with the Brewers. And now he's got the money. So Curious to see how Stearns goes about using his money here in this offseason. And I want to know, do you, do you think that things are going to change here significantly with the free agency with Stearns? Because what we saw under Epler and with Sandy Alderson at first is that the agents, like Scott Boris with Correa, they're going straight to Steve Cohen because they know he's controlling the money. And they're like, let's go, let's get this deal done. Is Cohen going to say, hey, you got to call David now. It's up to David. And how will that dynamic work? I think the 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 lesser known agents will be okay with that. But I think if, if Scott Boris, let's say next year, is not getting what he wants in the Pete Alonso deal, he's going to call Steve directly. How do you think that dynamics can work between Steve and David, and David Stearns? Well, I, I think that Steve is certainly going to try to establish protocol here and how he wants his team to be dealt with with the agents. And he didn't hire a president of baseball operations, so the firm, first phone call goes to to Steve himself. I mean, he wants Stearns doing all this. Um, will some agents try to circumvent Stearns if they don't get the answer they're looking for and go right to Steve and say, hey, do you know your president just turned down this incredible opportunity to pay Juan Soto $800 million? You know, um, So I, I would think that something like that could happen, but uh, I think he's going to make it known that he wants those phone calls going to Stearns. Because up until this point, he didn't have – a person in that position that he knew was going to be in that position a long time. Sandy right. Olson was clearly there to help Cohn get the votes with the owners because Alderson is so well-respected and, and Cohn was concerned that his reputation for spending money was going to prevent him from getting the votes. So he brings in Sandy Alderson, who is, you know, extremely well-respected among the owners and that worked. And then he needed someone to kind of guide him through the first couple of years. So Sandy was that guy. Epler was what the tenth or twelfth choice right. to be the general manager, and that was with the understanding that there was going to be a president hired over him. So Steve wasn't going to defer to Billy Epler on all this stuff. 
and the agents knew that, so they would go directly to Steve. Now he has a, a president on a long-term contract who he's wanted for this. This is the guy he's wanted for many years that um, I think that the agents will respect that initially uh, unless they get a lot of pushback and then they'll, you'll have to be remains to be seen whether they'll try to go over Stern's head to get right to Cohen. Right. And I know we didn't have a great regular season, but man, how much better would the Mets have been last year with Carlos Correa at third base? He was tremendous in the playoffs for the twins. We didn't have a great regular season. No, not at all. And I, you know, that, that one, I, that one didn't really upset me because there had to be something there if the Giants and the Mets both. Yeah. What upset me about that was that they were going into that move to make a, to make a change to help the team when it backfired and it didn't work out. They didn't pivot. They didn't sign somebody else. They well, just stood pat. That was the issue for me. Yeah. But you, my, my way of thinking was I thought Beatty had done well towards the end of the 22 season yeah. until he hurt his hand. Sure. And if he, if they said sign Correa, that would have blocked Beatty for a number of years and, you know, maybe expedited a move to the outfield. Maybe that's what they would have done. Because I really wanted him to be the everyday third baseman to open the season. Sure, and yeah. even though he hit a ton in spring training, they started off in the minors, which didn't make any sense to me. Yeah, that and might have affected get, his confidence too. His, his yeah. But he, I mean, he hit in Syracuse the first month or so, which yeah. is why they brought him up. But he never got into a rhythm at all. And then defensively he started having some problems. So I thought they mishandled him. Uh, last year. Absolutely. And hopefully he's bouncing back next year and he's been working on his defense and we'll see. Gary, this has been fun. I appreciate you joining us on here and believe in the Mets. I want you everybody to know where they could find you on, on your work, your social media, your newest book. Let everybody know where everything is right now. Yeah, you can get me at, uh, on Twitter at Gary Myers NY, like New York. And then my new book, um, once a Giant, a story of victory, tragedy, and life after football is about the 86 Giants and how they've dealt with the challenges of life after football. And Nick, I just want to tell you this. All I basically do is football. I'm really passionate about baseball, especially the Mets. I've been a fan of the Mets since day one in 1962. So it's really fun. I appreciate you asking me to come on here because it's just fun for me to talk baseball every now and then. Absolutely. And we'll, we'll certainly have you back. So everybody make sure you go read it. Gary stuff. You check him out on Twitter. Check us out on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube at Believe in the Mets at B L E A V I N T H E M E T S. Believe in the Mets. And I am on Twitter at Nick underscore Durst, Instagram at Nick Food and Stuff. So that's going to do it here for this episode of Believe in the Mets. And until next time, everybody, let's hope for the best and let's go Mets. 